Oh, uh, welcome everyone to, uh, what is this, day three of CPP Time. Uh, my name is Arthur Dwyer. Um, I'm going to be talking today about container adapters, exception guarantees, and SDL. Uh, the abstract for this talk uh, made it sound like I was going to talk a whole lot about FlatMap. Uh, given that FlatMap is out of C20 and uh, I found lots of interesting examples that are already in C++. We're actually going to be walking through a lot of examples that are not flat map, but they are flat map related. Um, so prepare yourself for some priority key flat. Um, by the way, a little bit about me. Um, I've been now to uh, three standards meetings, but I am not an ISO member. Um, uh, insider, outsider in that respect. Um, and uh, yeah, what else about me? I do C++ training. If you're, if you're looking for someone to come train me, I always let me know. Um, all right. Mostly in that. What do I mean about? What do I mean by this? Well, uh, this talk grew out of a blog post that I wrote uh, during the Chrono standardization meeting in February, um, where I was looking uh, during the LWG discussion of FlatMap at how existing uh, compiler or existing uh, library implementations handle uh, class invariants. Uh, and so we're going to start by looking at three fun examples, one of which has now been fixed. Um, and uh, I'm going to relate that to uh, what's been proposed for the flat set and flat map proposals. Um, we're going to look at something coming up in the committee that is uh, relevant to this area, not a complete fix, but definitely uh, indicating the committee has interest in fixing this sort of issue. Uh, I'm going to speculate on some possible uh, problems and solutions. Uh, well, I should say problems and possible solutions. Uh, and then we will probably have a lot of time for questions. I have a lot of slides, but a lot of them are walking through these examples. So I expect that to go quickly. We'll see what happens. All right. So for my first example here, and by the way, for each of these examples, I have a link in the upper right-hand side of the slide. So uh, if you get bored with my walkthrough, you can go to Godbolt Compiler Explorer and type in that short link, and you will see this happening live on both libc++ and libsdidc++. Um, let's make a priority queue. I'm assuming that if you're coming to learn about FlatMap, you already have some inkling of what a priority queue is. A priority queue has uh, inside itself a container, usually a vector uh, of its element type. In this case, we're going to be using vector. Um, and it also has a comparator. It keeps the vector sorted or arranged in uh, max heap order based on that comparator. So here I have my uh, comparator type. Normally it would be std less, but I wanted to do something more interesting. So I'm actually going to hold a, a std function. Uh, the, the comparator takes two elements. My element type is int, and it returns a bool. So we'll get to what that function is going to do in a minute. Uh, here's my priority queue. It uh, element type is int, container type vector of int, and it takes one of these comparators. So what does the comparator do? The comparator is this argument that I am passing to the priority queue constructor. So what I'm doing in this case is I wrote a lambda that simply returns a less than b. But let's say that your comparator does something complicated. I don't know what it's doing here. It shouldn't be doing this. But let's just say that it does this. This is obviously a pathological malicious user saying, when a is 2 and b is 3, throw oops. Uh, you can tell they are pathological or malicious because they are throwing const char stars. Please don't do this. Um, and then I've got some code at the bottom just to show you how to print the elements of, of a priority queue. We just pop off the uh, max element over and over, the top element over and over, and print them out in order. So I'm not going to show that code on the future slides, but uh, that is what's happening when we're printing the elements of the queue. So here's my code. Uh, I make my priority queue with my throwing comparator. I push 2, I push 2 again, I push 1, then I push 3. Now, I claim this is going to throw, uh, so I'm going to wrap it in a try-catch. You know, uh, this is, I'm expecting my comparator to throw an exception. I'm going to do it again. My comparator is going to throw again. I'm going to catch and ignore that exception. Uh, now, what state is my priority queue going to be in? We're going to walk through and see that. I'm going to push 4, and I'm going to print out the element. Let's walk through this. What happens? Here's my priority queue. This is my vector uh, with uh, capacity 7. I've drawn it a little staggered so that you can see the tree structure, right? the top element at the front. It's two children, those two children's two children. Um, 
So let's start inserting things. We push two, two goes in the front, that was easy. We push two again, uh, we compare two to two, uh, two is not less than two, they're in the correct order, we keep going, preserving our heap invariant. We push one, uh, two is in fact greater than one, we're preserving our max heap invariant, the max element is still at the front, we're all good. We push three, we compare two with three and that throws. Now since this throws, the rest of the function, the uh, heap sifting, does not happen. We do not go on and swap them. We don't know which one is less than the other one. So we got an exception. So we ignore that exception, and we go and we push three again. And we compare three to two, and again it throws, and we ignore that exception, and we go on. Now our priority queue is in this bad state, okay? Well, we'll push four anyway. We'll uh, compare one to four. Four is greater than one, we swap it up. Four is greater than two, we swap it up. And then we start printing off our elements. All right, we pop off four. The way we pop off from a priority queue is we swap to the bottom, and then we pull it off. Okay? And then we reheapify. We sift down, so uh, we swap, and we swap. Uh, and now we've preserved our heap invariant. Except, of course, our heap invariant was broken to begin with. Right? Our heap invariant was broken at the time that we did the pop. It remains broken after we do the pop. Question. Can you comment quickly on heap invariant? I'm not familiar. Uh, the heap invariant is, uh, as we are putting things into the heap here, um, every parent is greater than both of its children in terms of the comparator, which in this case is integer less than, except that it sometimes throws. So when we put in the three, we really wanted it to get swapped all the way up to the top uh, of the heap. But because one of those comparisons threw, we didn't actually finish uh, reheapifying. We didn't finish sifting it up. All right, so we uh, we pull off the four, and we reheapify. But we still don't have a heap because we you know garbage in, garbage out. Um, we swap the two to the end and pull it off. Uh, we swap the three to the end and we pull it off. We reheapify. Now we're back, we've got a nice heap, we pull the rest off in order. So this is the output that you get when you print the elements from highest to lowest of this priority queue with libc++. Now I handpicked an example that libstid c++ also gets wrong in a different way. So they actually produce different output for the exact same input. I just thought that was cute. Okay, so if we have a comparator that throws we put that inside a priority queue, we break our class invariant. Then bad stuff happens. We, we end up with a priority queue that is uh, in what the title of this talk calls a mostly invalid state. This is worse than a move from state. Right? This is not a valid but unspecified state for this class to be in. This is a class that has broken its container invariant. Um, so priority queue has a class invariant that's vector is always sorted by its comparator. So the whole point of having a class invariant is that it should invariably be satisfied. It is an invariant. Right? The only place you're allowed to break your invariant is maybe briefly inside a member function. By the time that member function exits, uh, your class invariant should be restored. But a throwing comparator can force priority queue push to exit after doing some work, breaking the invariant, but before restoring the invariant. So this means that then the outside user of the priority queue gets to see that broken invariant. Gets to see the class in an invalid state. Um, all right, so this puts the priority queue into a very bad state. So there are also other ways to break priority queues in variants. If we have a comparator, uh, such as this struct x here, whose copy assignment operator throws, this is also trouble for the standard priority queue. So here I have a struct x, uh, and it has a flag that allows it to sort up or sort down. Um, and Right, it's operator paren paren just does sort up or sort down, less than or greater than. Um, and uh, it has a copy assignment operator that throws. We put one of these into a priority queue uh, with the initialization 54321. Um, by the way, when you give an initializer list to a priority queue, it will call make heap on that, right? We're, we're not, we can't force bad input into a priority queue by giving it an out of order uh, initializer list. It will take the initializers where it's given by us, and then it will call make heap to make sure they're in sorted order. Um, but in this case, we're giving it something that already does satisfy the, uh, the max heap uh, ordering. Right? Five is greater than four and three. 
4 is greater than 2 and 1. Uh, and we create uh, ask, the ascending priority queue, uh, with a comparator that wants ascending order. And 1 is indeed uh, less than 3 and 2. 3 is less than 5 and 4. So we make desk and we make ask. And then we assign ask to desk. When we do this, it copies the container contents and it copies the comparator in some order. It turns out it does them in that order. That is kind of the logical order to do things in. So we copy the container contents and we copy the comparator which throws. Now desk is in a bad state. Again, it's broken its class invariant. Now we do the popping and printing, code not shown, but we swap one to the end and pop it off. We reheapify, uh, and when we reheapify, we look at that comparator. That's the ordinary, you know, less than comparator. So we're looking at a max heap invariant of four is less than, or sorry, four is greater than three and two. The max heap invariant is preserved. We're done. But of course, garbage in, garbage out. We pop off four. We reheapify. We pop off five. We reheapify. We need to swap those guys. Uh, we pop off three and we heapify, and we pop off two. Again, this is libc++'s output. Libs did C++, again, produces different wrong output. And I have not looked to see exactly what libs did C++ is doing that doesn't match my little, you know, CS101 diagrams. It seems like it should be doing exactly the same thing, but somehow it, it gets different answers. So I was talking with Billy O'Neill uh, here at the conference here. Um, he helped me greatly uh, with uh, coming up with these examples for this uh, presentation. So hat tip to him for this. Um, this is an example due to Billy. I would totally not have known this, this was a thing. And is fixed in the latest MSVC STL, uh, which was just released on GitHub, by the way, this upcoming example. Um, this upcoming example deals with uh, Visual Studio's unordered set. So unordered set is a hash set. That's what Java would call a hash set. It's a hash table, and uh, you have sort of a, a vector of buckets. Each bucket has a chain of members inside itself. You know, everything whose hash function collides goes in the same chain. Um, but MSVC does something a little interesting here. Its unordered set is actually implemented by composition of two different STL containers. When they made unordered set, they decided they were going to do it by having a vector of buckets. And instead of having a separate linked list for each bucket, they'll just have one big linked list. And the vector will have iterators into that linked list. We're going to see a diagram. So here's my unordered set S. And it has uh, two more primitive members inside itself. By the way, it also has at least two more members. It's got a member representing the hasher, and it's got a member representing the uh, key equal function that it uses for key comparison. In this particular example, my hasher is actually an empty uh, struct. There's nothing special going on with my hasher, and my key equal is the default std equal, uh, std equal to. Uh, so I didn't bother to show them here. But I am showing you the linked list else that's that first member there. That's a linked list of all the elements in the hash, in the hash table. And uh, the buckets vector. And the buckets vector contains iterators into the linked list. Actually, pairs of iterators, I think. I'm, I'm not showing all the details here. Uh, in this case, they came out like exactly in order. I don't think that they, they can like cross over each other. There's lots of implementation details I'm not showing. But I make my unordered set, and I put this data into it. One, two, five, six, seven. 10, 15, 66, uh, MSVC's unordered set will have eight buckets by default, so I'm showing that accurately. Here we have eight hash buckets, uh, and I have eight elements in my uh, list, which means that the load factor is one. So looking up an element here involves, uh, if I were to look up, let's say, 10, step one would be to hash it, giving size t 10. Uh, step two, mod by the number of buckets, so that would be in the second bucket. Um, that is the tooth bucket, which is actually the third bucket. Um, I look in the third bucket, which, uh, sorry, I should use my mouse cursor here, right? Zero, one, two, follow that down. This is now bucket number two. Um, 
And then I start key equaling the elements. Uh, 66 is not 10. Oh, there it is. And I could keep walking until I hit the, uh, the next bucket. Yes, they know when they traverse the list uh, where the next bucket is. Uh, and again, the details are going to be hand waved for that. Um, but you could imagine they just look forward to find the next not null pointer and, and then compare with that, something like that. I, I believe it is more involved than that. Um, oh, in, in fact, I believe what it is is that they have uh, two iterators per bucket, and there's a begin and an end. So they don't even have to do anything special. OK. Uh, so that is how we do lookup. Now, what's the other operation that hash uh, tables need to be able to do? Well, when the load factor gets above one, we're going to resize the buckets vector. And we're going to have to rehash all the existing elements. So in this particular example, when we insert a new element, uh, let's say with value nine, that brings our load factor above one. That means we have to rehash uh, from our existing eight buckets up to 64 buckets. All 64 buckets are not going to fit on my slide. Um, during the rehash, we're going to update the iterators in the buckets vector uh, to point to the first element of each new bucket. We may need to shuffle the list a little bit. I have no idea how MSVC decides it needs to do that or how that's accomplished, uh, other than that it's accomplished by shuffling pointers on the linked list and not literally moving the elements, right? That wouldn't be allowed. Um, but for example, in this case, uh, 66 and 2 would end up in the same bucket, mod 64. 10 is actually going to end up in a different bucket. And so I am going to have to swizzle those pointers around. Um, but that is not relevant to our example. What's relevant to our example is that we're going to have to rehash all the existing elements. How can I screw this up? Well, I can have my hasher operator, pren pren, throw an exception during the rehash operation. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to make my uh, hasher. I am going to initialize my unordered set exactly as we saw in the diagram. Then I'm going to set global variable throw on to five. Then I'm going to try to emplace nine. That's going to trigger a rehash of all the elements in the hash table. Uh, when it does, it's going to call my hash function. When my hash function reaches element number five, it is going to throw. I'm going to catch that exception and ignore it. What state is S going to be in? Here's my S. And here's how I'm going to, I'm going to do the rehash now. All right, we allocate a new buckets array of 64 buckets. I think there's 32 there. Imagine there's 32 more. And we're going to begin the rehash. We're going to start with the first element. We're going to hash one. We're going to put it in bucket number one. We're going to hash 66, 10, and 2. We're going to swizzle those pointers around through magic that is hand waved away here. Um, we're going to put them in bucket two and also in bucket 10. And then we're going to hash five, and that's going to throw. So we return that. Uh, we propagate that up. We do stack unwinding. And the user catches the exception and ignores it. So now, S begin and S end have not changed. They iterate the entire linked list. I can certainly use linear std find to find element number six in my now mostly invalid hash table. Uh, but if I call its actual find method that does the hash lookup, it will hash six, look in bucket number six, and because the buckets array was uh, incomplete, we threw in the middle of populating it, uh, the bucket appears empty. std find and s.find produce different answers. s.find says, no, six does not appear here. If you try to count how many sixes there are in my unordered set, it will say zero. But if you use the linear search, you'll find it just fine. Uh, we, we've managed to break our class invariants and put our container into a terrible, terrible state. A, a state where it is not even really like recoverable at this point. Right? I mean, it, it, there's no sense in which this even is a valid unordered set. Right? It, it sometimes claims to have an element, sometimes doesn't. Right? Th this is, I would say, worse than the priority queue example. Um, however, uh, Billy also mentioned this to me because he has fixed it. Fixed in master. Um, now, when this happens and the, uh, L, the uh, rehash happens, the exception is thrown, the rehash is aborted, the container is about to enter an invalid state, what does the STL do? Well, it restores the invariant. 
Still surprising? I'm, I'm like better, but also not good. So, so how do I relate this then to the, the ostensible topic of this talk, the flat set and flat map? Well, uh, flat set has the same kind of problem because it is built the same way as a priority queue. Right? It's a container adapter um, and it puts together uh, two different components that are both user provided. It puts together a user provided container and a user provided comparator. And it has a, what I'm calling a cross component invariant that uh, the container has to be sorted by the comparator. It's very easy to break that when you don't control either the container or the comparator. So various ways to break that include um, if we are doing copy assignment of flat sets, container assignment succeeds, but container assignment throws, uh, sorry, comparator assignment throws or vice versa. Um, we saw that in our second priority queue example. Um, if comparison throws during an operation that temporarily needs to break the invariant, such as insertion or deletion, um, that was our first priority queue example. Uh, also, if the element type itself uh, throws during a move assignment, during a swap, uh, that would also be bad. Right? The element type itself can actually do pathological things that break our container invariant. Uh, so Flatset has this kind of problem due to its unusual number of what I call cross-component invariants, right? such as the container is sorted by the comparator. And also, by the way, the container can't contain duplicates. So even if I find where I want to insert it and I put the duplicate you know, in there and, and then remove it again or something like that, that would still temporarily break my invariant. Uh, FlatMap has the same issues plus more. It has one more cross-component invariant, namely it has a keys container and a values container. Um, by the way, this is the proposed uh, FlatMap. It has two containers. This is called the split storage um, paradigm. Uh, the boost flat map, like prior art for flat map, uses a single container of pairs, key value pairs, in the same way that a, a std map and a std unordered map are containers of pairs. Um, the proposed flat map uh, design in, in PO429 uses split storage. There is one vector of uh, keys, one vector of values, and when you iterate over it, you use proxy iterators where the first and second members are, are references to the elements in each one. So maintaining these two vectors means that you have one more component and therefore uh, one more cross-component variant that the key container and the value container have to be in sync. So if key insertion succeeds but value insertion throws, right, maybe out of memory, something like that, I, I have enough memory to resize the keys container but not to resize the values container, um, that would also be a problem. That would also put us into an invalid state. So another pernicious case, oh, and I should have mentioned, by the way, as I'm doing these examples, I should have warned you to watch for this. Not all of these examples have the same failure mode. They all look superficially similar because they have the same cause, user-provided code throws, and they all have the same uh, symptom, which is terrible bad stuff happens. Um, but the mechanisms for fixing them in the standard may not all be the same. Right? The root cause here is slightly different in each case. Um, okay, so a pernicious case for a flat map is the extract member function. Uh, flat map is trying to be a little more user friendly than priority queue. Priority queue has the container member and the comparator member, uh, and they are both data members and they are both protected. How many people here have ever derived from std priority queue just so you can get out the container. Oh, well, I am legit raising my hand because I have totally done that. Um, right, it, it's a protected member, which means you have to derive from it if you want to get the container out. Um, flat set and flat map, as proposed, both have extract members that allow you to move out the container when you want to get at it, and then replace members that allow you to put the container back. Um, which again can allow you to deliberately break the invariant by messing with the container and, and then putting it back. But that would be, um, we could just say that's undefined behavior. I have no qualms about saying if you deliberately replace your container with a messed up container, right? Um, that would be on the order of instantiating it with a container that's not really a container. And when you clear the container, it puts 42 in it or something like that. That's a ridiculous container. Um, so extract moves out the 
container. As R value qualified, you say std move of my flat map dot extract, and you get a struct containing a keys member and a values member, which has the two containers in it. This allows you to quickly get out the keepified containers. Um, so it returns std move of that struct containing the two containers. Now that leaves your keys and values containers inside the flat map in their moved from state, right? I've moved out of them. They are now in their moved from state. The STL has no idea what your container's moved from state is. And when you have two containers, it has no idea what either of their moved from states are. And it has no idea if those states are compatible. If they're both empty, that's awesome. I still have a flat map, which is empty. But if one of them is empty and the other one contains move from elements or something like that, right, then the overall flat map is in an invalid state. And at that point, I can't even ask what is the, you know, dot size of my flat map because it doesn't even have a size. It's like half of it, like the keys have size zero and the values have size five. Like, what does that even mean? It doesn't mean anything. So, uh, PO429 mandates that the extract member function after moving out of the containers will explicitly call clear on both containers, which is mandated by the container requirements to make both containers empty. So we're moving out because we want efficiency. I, I am clearly done with my flat map, right? It's an R value, I'm moving out of it, and I'm taking these containers. And yet, in order to merely preserve the standard requirement that a move from flat map is in a valid but unspecified state, not an invalid state, but a valid state. We have to clear it. Uh, ben. Can we say that the, that the result of an extracted flat map is still a valid state for the flat map, but the only things you can do with that particular valid state are over assign it or, or delete it, uh, but not say get its size? Yes. Um, I believe that this is what people, I'm not sure, but I believe that this is what people on the committee mean when they say, when they talk about a radioactive state. It puts it into something like a radioactive state where you're, it's valid in the philosophical sense, um, and yet you can't even do operations on it that have no preconditions, such as size. Right? Normally when we say some, a container is in a valid state, what we mean is that you can do container operations on it that have no precondition. If I have a vector in an unspecified state, I know I can ask, how big is it? A vector has a size. Uh, in fact, I can push back onto a vector that's in an unspecified state. The result will be that same vector in whatever state it was in with one more element. Right? That's fine. Pushback has no precondition. Um, you know, the only things I can't do with a vector in an unspecified state are, let's say, you know, get its 40-second element because it might not have one. Right? That, there's a precondition on, on operator brackets. Um, but in flat maps case, a radioactive state, such as we would be in after a move if we didn't clear ourselves, that would be something where you're saying you can't even ask how big it is because it doesn't have a size. It's still valid, but it doesn't have a size. That's a very weird state to be in. So it, that's more of a semantic game, and I think uh, LWG is reluctant to play that kind of game. We do not have a lot of options, which I think is the title of my next slide, um, but we will come back to maybe that. The only thing we have to guarantee is that it's destroyable. Uh, well, I mean, technically, you don't even have to guarantee that. You could say you have to heap allocate it and drop it on the floor, but you know, when it gets in a radioactive state, you're not allowed to delete it, you know, something like that. But that would obviously also be terrible. These are all terrible options uh, over here. What's the advantage to using two separate containers? Um, I have not benchmarked it, so I, this is not the answer. This is merely the received wisdom. But uh, the received wisdom is that by putting all the keys very close together, you get better cache locality on lookups. Because you're looking at the keys, there's no values interspersed with them. Um, I've seen numbers both ways, though. I've also seen lookup being terrible regardless, because what are we doing? We're, we're doing a binary search in the keys array. Binary search, by definition, starts in the middle, hops way over here, hops way over here, hops way over here. Like, that's not cache friendly no matter how you implement. Um, there was a question over here somewhere. Uh, I just want to clarify, it extracts both. Uh, keys and values, yes. 
extract extracts both keys and values. So it, it could just state that after it will extract those, it's in a move to the state. Uh, it could just state that after you extract both keys and values, the flat map is in a move from state. Yeah. But the flat map is not in a move from state. It might have, it, it's two subcomponents, which are user provided, are both individually in move from states. The flat map itself has a container invariant, like these two have to have the same size. Yeah, but once you extract the, all the needs out of the, out of the container, it's, it's like it's moved from state. Once you extract the meat out of the container, it's like it's moved from state. It is yeah, like it might, a move from have state. Some rice and beans, but but it, <laughs> it is not in a valid state, right? If I can't call dot size on it, it's not in a valid state. Yes, you, you, you can call dot size on a move from state. I just finished saying this. Uh, right, when, when an object in the standard library, at least, has been moved from, uh, all of the standard objects do have this guarantee that after you move from it, it is still in a valid state. You don't necessarily know what state it's in. It's unspecified. But it's in a valid state where you can still do all the operations that you could do on a container in any unspecified state. Okay. Just like a function parameter coming in. Like, I don't know what state it's in. But I know I can ask for its size. I know I can push back onto it. Right? This is, this is a different kind of thing. So when you say unspecified state, that means that invariants hold, right? Yes. Invariant, class invariants should hold even for an unspecified state. It, it is a state. It's a state of the class. The invariants should hold for every state of the class. But about the valid thing, isn't the loosest requirement just that it is destructible or basically assignable to? So you have some loose requirement, and that's all we offer in some cases. Also, the other thing about hashing, if I write a, a hash function, it's sort of common sense that it shouldn't throw because the world will obviously blow up. So even if the standard doesn't guarantee or require that the hash function doesn't throw, common sense is if you write a hash function that throws, you're basically it. Yes, uh, so there are, there are two comments there. One was, could we just say that there are no container invariants other than destructibility. Um, and everything else is sort of quality of implementation would be the standard ease way of saying it. Uh, you know, like, like maybe when you call top on the priority queue, you get the top element. And you know, sometimes you don't, but at least it's destructible. Um, <laughs> that, yeah, mm, um, now, is it stupid for the user to write a throwing uh, hash function? Absolutely, yes. And I will get to that. Yes. All right. Um, so another pernicious case on flat map specifically would be insert. Uh, this is the currently proposed wording for uh, insert. Um, adds elements to C as if by this loop where we insert them one at a time. Uh, this is very slow. Uh, it would be nicer if we could insert them all as a batch and then reheapify the entire, or sorry, resort the entire keys vector and the entire values vector. Um, but by uh, mixing in a whole lot of new information at once, we're increasing the chances that something in there, uh, maybe the comparison, maybe the move assignment, uh, might throw. Uh, and if it does, then uh, we've lost more of the user's data. And so there's this, um, again, terrible, terrible choices we have to make of what do we value? Do we value trying to maybe be a little user friendly and preserve more of their data in this very rare uh, case where we get an exception. Um, and I'll note in passing uh, for the slides on that uh, the wording there where it calls ranges unique is wrong, wrong, wrong. Ranges unique does not use the uh, comparator. The, oh, it uses key equiv of comparator. Well, maybe that's right now. Key equiv would be something that would have to uh, return equal, equal, uh, not less than. So the typical LWG response to this is uh, the way Billy fixed uh, MSVC's unordered set. Right. Take off and nuke it from orbit. It's the only way to make sure. So Billy, who helped greatly with this talk, by the way, but all the mistakes are mine, uh, wrote uh, P1843. I think this was presented in Cologne. Uh, it might have been in the, the post-meeting mailing. I'm not sure. Um, it's called uh, Comparison and Hasher Requirements. And it's a response to an LWG issue titled Throwing Swap Breaks Unordered Container State, specifically about that unordered set issue that we saw. Um, as we see, the issue is much larger. It affects uh, priority queue. And it may affect other uh, types as well. 
I looked, uh, in preparing this talk, I looked at std vector. You might think inserting into the middle of a std vector would also have this problem because you have to move everything down, insert in the middle, and then if that throws, maybe you have to move things back, and if that throws, maybe you have to throw some stuff out. Uh, it turns out that's not a problem. Um, many of the containers are already designed um, either intentionally or unintentionally based on the tools available in the 1980s. Uh, but for example, uh, what vector will do is uh, copy everything down one at a time, right, with move assignment. And then we have a move from element here, which I can then move assign into. And if that throws, I still have a vector. It might have a move from element in the middle, but I still have a vector. Um, so P1843 proposes in part that in the priority queue uh, swap uh, method, um, it requires, of course, a container and compare both be swappable, not necessarily no throw swappable, but if uh, swapping the containers throws an exception, um, either there are no effects on the containers or, and I've been informed that the intent of this wording is after the swap happens and before we return, uh, we will clear the container. Right. Nuke it from orbit. If we get in a, one of these invalid states, we will restore the container invariant by whatever means necessary. If that means trashing user, user's data, that's what we're gonna do. Now this seems to me user hostile. I'm not saying this isn't the best option, but I am saying it seems user hostile. Right? Because the current buggy behavior of priority queue, uh, the behavior I demonstrated at the beginning of the talk in those two examples, that's exactly what any working programmer would expect based on a sort of CS101 explanation of how priority queue works. Right? It has a container, it has a comparator, uh, and then what it does is it calls, you know, push heap and pop heap, and they throw, and when they throw, they leave the container in an interesting state, you know. And they could just assume that all of these special members were defaulted. In practice, they are not, at least on libc++, uh, but it would be an ABI break to make them defaulted. Um, but you can pretty much understand the existing behavior of priority queue, this buggy behavior this behavior that leads to these invalid states that are not really priority queues. But at least it is understandable based on a very simplistic understanding of how a computer works. It makes perfect sense that this would happen. The standard library would have to actually cruft up their implementation with extra code paths. Code paths that would never be hit in any non-pathological case. Um, you know, and it, it uh, destroys trivial copyability. Um, it adds all of this dead try catch code. Um, so it, it would preserve the priority queues invariant, but it would also destroy the programmer's data and have all of these bad sort of maintainability effects to try to deal with this in the way that it seems that we are trying to deal with it. Right. Nuke it from orbit. Unfortunately, that seems to be the only tool at our disposal. That is, the two options seem to be nuke the user's data or don't, use, don't nuke the user's data and then we're in this invalid state and we don't want that either. Um, so when I was discussing FlatMap with uh, committee people, the discussion would inevitably go something like this. Someone would say, ah, well, when the um, values container reallocation fails after the keys container allocation has succeeded, or when comparison fails or something like that, we must either break the container invariant or nuke the entire container, right? Clear it. Um, and then someone else would say, ooh, well, those are terrible. Like, I, maybe we don't have to nuke all the user's data. Maybe we can figure out some clever algorithmic hack that might prevent that bad thing from happening in the first place, right? Like maybe, well, what if we swap the comparators first and then the, and then the containers second, or, well, what if we put in an if const expert so we could detect whether swapping would fail, and then we could do the fast thing, and then only if it could fail do we do the slower, you know, and then we'd spend 10 minutes talking about that particular thing, and then we'd move on to the next member function and do it all over again, because that one also had issues. Yeah. Um, so this took a lot of time, and I don't think any conclusion was really reached, at least when, um, when I was there in Kona. So, unfortunately, again, we don't have many tools at our disposal. Um, R6 of the paper, which has now been superseded by an R7, had even tried a uh, screenshot of uh, the paper here, the proposed wording, um, 
proposes that there be a non-member swap function which is no accept, but which is constrained. This template participates in overload resolution only if every single subcomponent of the flat map is no throw swappable. If any component provided by the user has a possibly throwing swap, then the flat map will just not be swappable. Problem solved. Right? No more swapping of flat maps. Now, as it turned out, that didn't work anyway because std swap will totally swap your flat maps. Um, you know, it's it's fine. Right? There's a there's an unconstrained template to swap things. Um, but uh, you know, this wording has thankfully already vanished. Right? The problem is we're not entirely sure what to replace it with, other than constraints on the entire flat map. That, for example, uh, your comparator had better be no throw swappable, or you won't be able to instantiate the type. That's a much saner uh, approach, I think. So, so that you can have uh, a, a pullback uh, implementation that is instantiated in those cases. Could you drop requirements from the container? By requirements, do you mean things like it's sorted, or do you mean things like it has a swap function? No, it, I, I mean insertion is all one. Insertion is so like one. algorithmic complexity yeah. requirements. Um, so, so I can that is already kind of done. So for a lot of algorithms. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I don't think there would be much resistance to saying things like if something, like if the comparator is throwing, then we will do linear search instead of binary search. Uh, I don't think there would be resistance necessarily to such an idea if it solved the problem. I don't immediately see how it solves any of these problems, though, you if can, you just change you the have, algorithmic you requirements. Have a, a, a much better implementation of the insert Actually saves all the states before, and uh, and, if, and if it goes wrong, you just yeah, you, go you, back to the, the, back, the, the previous. You, you can have a fatter sort of like we do copy and swap. You can yeah. have a copy and find <laughs> something like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I suppose you could. I, there might be some resistance to that. I'm not sure. <laughs> but that that's the naive implementation. You can do it. That's yes. Yeah. Some, something like copy and swap can save us in some of these cases. All right, so uh, at first glance, I mean, I, I think the, the first tool that we would use here would be undefined behavior, um, right? As you said, like a user should not be throwing from their hasher, the user should not be throwing from their comparison function. Uh, if an exception is thrown from one of these things, we could just say, uh, well, that's undefined behavior. And then you don't need to be in a valid but unspecified state. Your program has undefined behavior. It can do whatever it wants regardless of anything at that point. Um, so we should probably just say explicitly in the standard library clauses that you know, any type uh, which is used as a hasher, any type used as key equal, any type used as compare, um, must not, shall not throw. Right? If it does throw, you violated the shall clause, you have undefined behavior. Now, I would explicitly caution, not that the committee needs this caution, but that does not mean that the is no throw invocable uh, trait should return true because many, many code bases out there have operator pren prens that are not no except. I mean, most code bases, I would say, still have some non-const operator pren prens left in them, uh, you know, let alone no except. People generally are not marking their operator pren pren no except, and I don't think that they should have to. On the other hand, if their operator pren pren actually does throw, well, then I'm perfectly happy saying that they have undefined behavior. Um, on the other hand, Operator print print of the hasher, I think we all agree that shouldn't throw. On the other hand, something like copy assignment, making a, a copy of a state, like that could totally throw. Platonically, a hasher is a function, but a function can still throw. Oh, you mean the operator equal of the hasher shouldn't be allowed to throw because platonically it's just a function. Unfortunately, std function has a throwing copy assignment operator. Um, so, um, so I think that the solution, like any formal solution to this, is going to have to uh, talk about exception guarantees. 
For those unfamiliar, there are uh, basically three or four, depending on how you count, exception guarantees um, in the literature uh, that, that people should be aware of. When someone says that my function provides the strong exception guarantee, what they mean is that either the operation, the intended operation succeeds, or else when an exception is thrown, there is no effect. An exception is thrown, you roll back, or you, you had no effect in the first place using something like copy and swap. Um, the strong guarantee is a reliable building block. Right? Even when an exception is thrown, I know the state of my program. This is a reliable building block for larger algorithms. Unfortunately, the STL has no um, notion of the strong guarantee. It has no way for users to indicate that they provide it, and in general, STL components themselves do not provide the strong guarantee, except as explicitly marked, and there are a few, uh, particularly around vector. Vector is a very strong exception safe kind of type. Um, explicitly, marked. explicitly marked in the paper standard. There, there will be a line that says the effects of this function are, and, and if it throws, then there are no effects. Um, by the way, there are no effects is, of course, a misnomer. There are always effects. Time is always passing. Right? Um, but uh, that, that's the standard ease for it. Um, Basic guarantee says uh, either the operation succeeds or the component enters a valid but otherwise unspecified state. Right? The basic guarantee, the basic exception guarantee is the basics of what we should all strive for. Even if you do nothing else, if you claim to be writing code that uses exceptions as opposed to just dicking around with code, right? Uh, if you're using exceptions, you are providing the basic exception guarantee. When you throw an exception, you, you are you're still in a valid state. It may, you may not know what that state is, but at least it's valid and you can recover. If you can't recover, you are not using exceptions because when you catch an exception, you don't know what you can do. There you go. Um, you say the STL has a way to indicate I provide the strong guarantee. Yes. Do you mean it with signature or do you mean in wording? Because I, I mean, in wording we can. Right. In, in wording, uh, the STL can require it of users. Uh, and user types in some cases, yes. Uh, and the STL can also advertise it in writing for their own types, such as pushback. Um, but uh, I meant programmatically, uh, the library vendor cannot actually verify that a provided type has the strong guarantee, and let's say, and then program on it. I've met a program against that. If the user provided Operator paren paren has the strong guarantee. I can do this. Otherwise, I will fall back to that. Right? There's no way to metaprogram that today because there's no way to test to say does it have the strong guarantee or not. Okay, but do you mean All we can do is require on paper and advertise on paper. We'd need some indication in the signature to say that. We'd need some indication in the signature or a specialized type trait or an attribute. I, I don't know, you know, but we have nothing at the moment. Yeah. Yes. Um, finally, there is no guarantee. Uh, and this is what priority queue has. Right? E either the operation succeeds or the component enters an unspecified and possibly broken state. If you do this, you are not using exceptions because when an exception is thrown, you have zero way to recover from it because all your things are in some absolutely invalid state. You can't even call size on them anymore. Um, and we can get into this state pretty easily through uh, generic programming, through composing user-defined components. If any of my user-defined components give only the basic guarantee such that my higher level algorithm, such as priority queue, uh, has two different components, both of which provide the basic guarantee, and some cross-component invariant that must be held between them, I'm in trouble. Right, I end up here. If an exception is thrown from a user-provided component through an STL object with cross-component invariants, then uh, the STL doesn't know the user-provided component state Right? It provided the basic guarantee, so we know it's in some state, but we don't know what that state is. Um, and we have an invariant that needs preservation between that component and some other component. But when we don't know this guy's state, then the invariant may be broken, and we have no way of checking that. And that means our invariant is broken, and that means we are not in a valid state. And that means we can provide no guarantee at all. We cannot even provide the basic guarantee, other than by eliminating container invariants, such as Priority queue maybe sometimes isn't a priority queue. Like quality of implementation. Um, so the STL object likely ends up in an invalid state. And the only way that we know to recover from this at runtime is nuke it from orbit. Right? Clear the container or in some other way, you know, drastically 
restore the container invariant going back to a known state, even if that means losing data. So is there a way forward? Uh, as I've heavily indicated here, I suspect the answer will involve somehow codifying the notion of strong exception guarantee into the standard library clauses, at least, to say that, that certain things on paper shall provide the strong exception guarantee. Again, we, uh, we can also say that things uh, shall not throw. Um, we already require that of allocators. Um, that is, actual memory allocation, of course, can and is expected to throw. However, if I have an allocator object and I move assign it, or I copy assign it, or I swap two allocators, that is never allowed to throw. Now, the, standard, the, the standard says allocators shall not throw in, in these cases uh, for these operations. They have the no throw guarantee. So we, we do have precedent for doing that, and I think we could also apply the no throw guarantee to a uh, hasher when, when, you, uh, when, you hash, when you call the hasher. I don't think we would, could require it of hashers copy assignment, for example. Well, maybe we could, but because std function has a throwing copy assignment, I, I am reluctant to do that. And also, it could be a lambda that captures a std string that has throwing copy assignment. There, there's, um, so, however, I do think providing the strong exception guarantee would be reasonable um, and requiring that. Sure, but we have this concept of enabled hash functions where we say where we say something about that it should be guaranteed that we not throw unless we use a user defined type. So we, we are going partially in that direction oh, for hash functions. So enabled specializations of std hash are not allowed to throw from their current friend? Yeah. Oh, I was not aware of that. Yeah. Um, so it is going in that direction. That doesn't yes. cover user provided hashes at all. Yeah, but, so, but, but it covers std hash specialization. So I suspect that there would not be resistance to requiring the no throw guarantee of, of hashers and comparators, operator print for n in general. I, I'm less sure about things like you, yeah. uh, copy construction. Yeah, um, <laughs> things like copy construction though for for stateful uh, comparators uh, because they could be lambdas that capture std strings. Like you you have to allocate and that might throw. Um, so I I don't think that that will be a short discussion for those member functions for operator print for n. I think that could be a very short discussion. Um, right. So that also means that when the STL provides a class that is likely to be used as a hasher, a comparator, et cetera, such as std function, uh, I think that the STL should go out of its way to provide the strong exception guarantee because it knows that we are going to be using that class as a building block. And the only way to use any class or any operation, I should say, as a, as a building block, as a reliable building block, is to make sure it has a strong exception guarantee. If it has the basic guarantee, you can't use it as a building block for larger things. I'm not sure I heard a question there. That we, we may not require a uh, non throwing copy assignment. Okay. Maybe? <laughs> um, however, I think this is just about the last slide. So as, that's the way forward. Um, strong exception guarantee. Uh, standard should provide strong exception guarantee on some of its types that are going to be used as building blocks. Probably we should require the no throw guarantee of operator print friends in some cases. Uh, that would be a short discussion, I would hope. And with that, thank you.
They say you're asking, is there, so at the moment, there is no way to detect a broken it that a container, a specific object has broken its invariants. You would like to detect that in a debug mode. How would you go about doing that? Um, in the specific case, uh, well, actually, the first thing that comes to mind in the specific case of std variant, sort of has that. Variant has a sort of, sort of invariant, variant has an invariant, ironic, um, that it's not valueless by exception, and yet it has a member function valueless by exception that allows you to test for that. Um, so could we put something similar into something like priority queue or unordered set, right? Could that be a solution? Um, you know, you, you have a valueless, valueless by exception on just every container, right? Um, like when you use a unordered set, you can generally assume that it's not in this state, but if you wanted to test after an exception, you could say, did this, did this cause a, a, a broken invariant in my unordered set? Um, that is actually an interesting idea, um, but you'd, that would be adding state to the container. So it would be an ABI break, so no one would do it, and also you'd be paying for that extra state. Um, you know, people might not want to pay for it even if they took the ABI break. And you'd have to write the runtime code to, you know, someone would have to imagine all the cases that you could enter that valueless state and, and again, insert code just like that code I was complaining about in priority queues, copy assignment operator. Like, if you're gonna insert code there already, I already consider that having lost at least half the battle. And then it's just, well, what code do we put there? Do we set the valueless by exception flag, or do we just clear the container and we're done? Um, so I think that's very interesting. I haven't heard that before, but I don't think that it is likely to be a good idea. Uh, other questions? Aside from the um, you patch, are there other cases? Like the, uh, oh, uh, could you use the mic? Sorry, I totally forgot about the mic. <laughs> um, actually, I. <laughs> All right. Um, any uh, other questions, comments? And please use the mic if so. Is there any way to to query if? Uh, if if a function or a method is uh, can throw, is there any way to query if a, an operation can throw? Yeah. Um, well, the uh, the basic answer is yes, and the expert answer is no. Right? Uh, the basic <laughs> answer is you can certainly ask if it's no accept. Right? That would be if if the user has annotated it with no accept. Mm -hmm. You can query for that at compile time. But even um, no accept things however, can throw, right? Um, yes, non, well, other way around. If no accept functions will never throw. They may abort, okay. they may deadlock, <laughs> they may run forever, but they will never throw. Right? Uh, no accept <laughs> functions will never throw, period. Okay. However, non no accept functions, such as hash or operator friend friend, you know, like nobody marks that no accept, right? Because mm -hmm. it's just noise at the end of the line. Nobody does that. But it still doesn't throw. No, no sane person would write a throwing uh, comparator. So um, unfortunately, the standard library cannot ever, uh, you know, bondage and discipline say you shall put no accept any more than it could say. I mean, it should say you, thou shall put const on your operator print friends. But there could be uh, a trait that tests if the compiler can prove that this will not throw. Uh, could we introspect into the code of the comparator to see whether it might throw? Yeah. Um, even then, uh, number one, no, the compiler writers are not going to like that, so no. <laughs> right? um, uh, also, that would make the implementation of the function part of the interface, which is being resisted on things like no accept auto. Mm -hmm. um, so that there's precedent for saying, no, we're, we're not going to do that for philosophical reasons, as well as the technical reasons that it's very hard to you know, and then different compilers would be one would be smarter than the other. They'd give different answers. You don't want that, um, and uh, you'd have to somehow do it recursively because this function might call some other function that's not marked no accept, but also never throws. So you'd have to go look at that one, and you'd look at a, a huge tree of code. So you know, I don't think that's feasible at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was, I was and thinking, it may be in some other translation. I, that you may not have I was thinking that it would be. Like you said, it would be one compiler could could say something is can throw, and then the other one would say I I don't know. Yeah, I mean, 
users who care about advertising that I don't throw will use no accept. Um, that is the standard solution. Uh, the, the practical problem is the large number of real code bases in industry that, that don't care about advertising that but still need to work. We have to make them compile, even if they, you know, in this case that never happens, you have undefined behavior. Yeah, they don't care about that part. If it never happens, if you, they would care about not. Complying. If you can, uh, my my reasoning is that if you can provide uh, a stronger guarantee for exceptions, uh, when you can prove that this is no throw uh, and a slower implementation that the user pay if if he can throw. Could we have a fallback in the case yeah. that things are not no accept? This is what I refer to as the vector pessimization, I think was mm -hmm. one of the big mistakes, uh, the original sin of, of C++ 11. Um, <laughs> vector, yeah, vector reallocation. Um, in C++ 03, it would do the only thing you could do in C++ 03. It would copy each element down from the old buffer to the new buffer when you reallocate a vector, and then it would destroy the old buffer. Now in C++11, we got move semantics. Move semantics allow us to move, 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 and then destroy. That's much, much faster. However, people on the committee were concerned that move construction could throw. Obviously, it never should. Right? Move construction is one of these things like hashing that no sane person would throw unless you were MSVC. Um, <laughs> and, um, so what happens instead is they, well, it, First of all, they said move construction might throw. So we might get halfway through moving and then an exception happens and now we have, like, we don't have our, we can't provide the strong exception guarantee. Whereas in C++03, we could provide the strong exception guarantee here. Um, and so rather than either saying thou shalt never throw from a move constructor, uh, which Nico says, yeah, it's not that easy. Yeah, it's true. Um, or saying uh, vector reallocation provides the basic guarantee instead of the strong guarantee. I think would have been quite feasible in the presence of a throwing new constructor. Instead, they said, we're going to add a new keyword, no accept. People are going to put it on their move constructors. And if you don't put it on your move constructor, like you're, upgrade, you're already upgrading the C++11, so you're writing a move constructor, but you've decided not to write no accept. Uh, if you ever do that, then we will fall back to copying. And we will copy everything and then destroy the originals just like we did before, and you won't get the benefits of move semantics. Mm -hmm. um, and this means a lot of people who got the first part of the memo about C++11, the move semantic part, but they missed the later memo about having to mark everything no except. And by everything, I mean just your move constructor. Nothing else in the entire li library cares about no except. Just the move constructor and just because of vector reallocation. But if you miss that memo, you're quietly getting pessimization on every vector reallocation. You're getting copies of things. So how many people implement the move constructor? I mean, the default behavior is fine. The default behavior will detect whether we throw or whether we can guarantee to throw or not to throw. You so if this is only knowledge, people <laughs> have to know who implement the move constructor themselves. And that's right. not the majority of people. That's those who write special Yes, this is only something you have to know if you write a move constructor yourself or if you follow the rule of zero and one of your members has a throwing move constructor. No, 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 then you don't have to do that. Oh. If you follow the rule of zero and you have a std list member on MSVC, it will quietly copy the entire list, which is a linear time operation every time you resize a vector. If you want to eliminate that behavior, you write a uh, defaulted move constructor and you mark it no accept to override the, the default of not no accept. Um, this is rare, but when people see it, yeah. who you know may not be experts as, as some of the people in this room, um, you know, that they're quite surprised. I think they would be much less surprised if Vector got the basic exception guarantee and all of this stuff yeah, just went away. We could remove it. I mean, that, that's something we introduced in 98. In 98, we gave the strong guarantee. Right. And we can't silently remove it. End of discussion. Because we would break existing programs. And if they say we don't have to create a backup of the vector, and suddenly this is a security risk, we can't do that. That was yep. no option at all. So we can argue, yes, we should never have given the strong exception guarantee to vector. But that chip has passed. Uh, to repeat for the, the video, uh, Nico says, we gave the strong exception guarantee. Um, you know, 
possibly unintentionally, you know, that it just fell out that we have a strong exception here. No, no, no. That was a very late paper just before we finished C++ 11. It was driven by two guys and we discussed it. That was not an, an No, I mean in, in 98. In 98, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. It was a very important, we had a big discussion on that. Yeah. So Vector provided the strong exception guarantee in 98, therefore in 11, uh, it was not considered feasible to roll it back to the basic yeah, exception guarantee, even for performance. And that's yes. not enough. Yes. If life depends on that, you don't want to have that. Just recompile, and suddenly you can't use your vector anymore after a second. No. Yeah. No way. All right, uh, Ben. So I may be wrong, but it seems to me that many people already, maybe outside of the committee, already think of moved from objects as what the committee says is radioactive. That is you should only destroy or assign them. Why is there such distaste in the committee for for adding, for narrowing uh, function preconditions like size? Is it something that the library needs that doesn't, because I almost never see that in code bases I've worked in. Um, I mean, at least part of the distaste would certainly be philosophical. I mean, the idea that if I have a priority queue object, an object of type priority queue, it should be a priority queue. And that means it, ha it follows the invariance, um, right? That is type, that's type-based design. That is the purpose of C++. If I can have a priority queue object that doesn't hold a priority queue, what am I doing? Now, I, I don't know if there are other technical reasons for it, but that's my sort of visceral philosophical so, so, function. But you can you can say it's still a priority queue, but I can't call any functions on it. Like a valid but unspecified could be interpreted to mean I may only destroy or assign, and I'm and I'm not allowed to call size, right? It's just it's an engineering choice to allow us to call size. But as far as I know, and I may be wrong, like I've never seen people calling size on the move from object. Does this happen in the library? Is there a deeper reason why the committee is unwilling to narrow the preconditions? There are certainly some generic algorithms, uh, like uh, you might want to do this with rotate, for example, that would move from or copy from a move from object. Right? If I have a range where I've already moved from some of it, and now I want to shuffle the elements so that the move from elements are at the back, that involves assigning out of a move from object. So that would probably also have to go in, in your set of things I can do with a radioactive object. And you might say that's not a problem, but it makes me suspect that there might also be other operations. Maybe they're all special members, right? We have to be able to swap move from objects, but I, it's a lot easier to say anything with no precondition. Like that's very clear what it means and we're unlikely to add, need to add things to it later for technical reasons. Okay. Uh, Nico, can you use the mic? Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I should ask Howard. Yes. <laughs> so we we have the intention in the standardization that we say a move from object is always in a valid but unspecified state. End of discussion. Because Except if we violate that, that means um, we are in big trouble regarding the guarantees of uh, um, the, the basic guarantee and other guarantees we have. So and it's common to use that. Um, if you have a move from string, you can assign a new value. If you have a move from string, you can call size and is there still something? And even sometimes people do that. I mean, if you have a, if, if you pass a unique pointer to a function, taking it by our value reference, you can afterward find out was the value moved away from the unique pointer or not. So the basic guarantees, and, and that's, that's our really guarantee throughout the whole system, otherwise it breaks down, is after move from, we are in a valid but unspecified state. This is a different state than when we had exceptions. When we had exceptions, um, we are no longer in a in guaranteed valid state. So then uh, we, have, we have this, if a vector is, has an exception, and we don't have this strong Guarantee. We all we guarantees. We have the basic guarantee, so there will be no leaks. There will be no memory leaks, etc. So, what you should no longer use a vector at all. No, just destroy it, and it's good. And the basic guarantee only gives us the opportunity to, to say, well, now even if there is a is a is a exception, you can continue to use it. 
and 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 that's that's us the two things we want to have consistent throughout the whole library because otherwise we are creating some confusion i think so i think we have to discuss a, a few things here i think the i don't think we want to violate this policy if we find a solution like for flat map etc to have a more expensive implementation that gives us better guarantees in cases some people tell us um, we have um, they guarantee not to throw great and then the I might interject on uh, flat map specifically uh, because it came out of SG14 and it's called a flat map uh, there is also strong non-philosophical objection to having it fall back to inefficient uh, algorithms in any case so the other option is okay then to say let's not fall back let's if we run into the case that we have an ex exception then no longer use it end of discussion so make sure as a user that you only use it for types and comparators and headers that don't throw end of discussion yeah. that's all I think the target users of this in industry are exactly the sort of people <laughs> who forget to write no accept on some of their functions sometimes. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. Problem. But un undefined behavior is not a bad thing in, in that area unless you get it. I mean, cool yeah, so, so as long as you don't have an exception, everything is fine. <laughs> um, now, it, it does occur to me, by the way, and I should have put this in the talk, and I hope we're still being recorded. Um, if not, I'll make a blog post. Um, that uh, the, base, the no guarantee, basic guarantee, strong guarantee could also, those words could also be used to describe what we require of move from objects, even though you just said they're different things. But a, a valid but unspecified state is exactly the state that is entered when you throw from an operation with a basic guarantee. The strong guarantee would be something like what we re require for allocator types when they are moved from. An I allocator type, when you move from it, must have the exact same value it had before you move from it. Their move is tantamount to copy. Uh, this is required, and that's sort of analogous to a strong guarantee. The move from object has not changed. Um, whereas with other objects, we have the move from object does change, but we don't necessarily, or may change to some other state, but at least it's still valid. Um, and then you have things, of course, like unique footer, where when you move from them, they enter a very well-known state, um, and there's no problem with that. I'm not sure that the basic guarantee is the same as valid, but uh, unspecified state. We should discuss that. That's the one part of what I just said I am sure of, so we will discuss that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, we are, we are 15 minutes into our half-hour break, and I think we are definitely done at this point. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry.